I'm Rosara Teresi. I go by Dr. T in academic settings and use she, her pronouns. I am the founding director of the Long Island Institute of Sex Therapy and owner of That Drawer, a custom curated erotic boutique in Syosset. So today we're going to talk about pelvic pain, sexual responses, and exploring bodies, whether solo or partnered. Pelvic pain is something that it can occur for many reasons and have many causes. Sometimes there are things that help, sometimes things don't. But overall, the more we know about our own bodies, the better. So being in charge of your care as much as possible is really important. This can mean asking lots of questions from our medical providers. Bringing questions with you is often very helpful. Writing them down in a way, not just on your phone, but actually in a way that's printed out or handwritten on a piece of paper so that if you're too nervous to ask a question, you can hand that piece of paper over to your provider and say, okay, I have these questions here. You look at them, see if you can answer. But this way, we're not left with only Google or WebMD to help us ask the important questions about what's going on with our bodies. Um, overall, something to really pay attention to with our bodies is about knowing what something was like before an activity, to pay attention during an activity, and then also afterwards. So we're going to jump into sexual response cycles. And this is generally something that people think of as this linear model where we start here and then end up over here. And then there's this kind of drop and a plateau phase. And that works for some people, but for many people, it's something very cyclical and not such a straight line. Overall, people need to feel a great sense of safety with themselves, with any partners that they're with in the space that they're in. Spontaneous arousal of this, oh, I'm suddenly horny thing can absolutely happen, but it's definitely not the norm. And arousal has many different stimuli around the world. It can be a temperature, a song, a picture you see, a smell. Those are also things that can also help support an erotic environment for you. So also when we're thinking about doing things on purpose in terms of stimulating erotic desire, that is something that we want to be creating as a whole environment for ourselves and to pay attention to that. Responsive desire is also a part of sexual response cycles for many people. And this can actually trip some people up because they're waiting to feel something in their bodies happening. But sometimes it does that arousal in the body doesn't happen until some activity is already happening. So it could be instead of kind of, oh, you know, I saw this really sexy movie and now I'm aroused or um, you know, it's two o'clock on Tuesday and that's, you know, enough for me. That doesn't always hold true and it doesn't stay that way, even if it was something that you once experienced. And instead, responsive desire is the experience of engaging in a sexual activity with another person. And then as that's going well, as you're feeling good about it, as the other person's feeling good, that that actually is what gets that whole system going in your body. So waiting for that to start isn't always like waiting to start sexual activity when your body is already aroused might not actually be the case. This can be really confusing for people and sometimes especially difficult with any pelvic pain because pelvic pain can, can be helped by arousal or it can be exacerbated or cause flare-ups with sexual arousal. So some people stay away from that sensation in their bodies. Other people feel a little bit more open to different experiences and their bodies are more relaxed for experiences as they're moving through them. And a part of that is also about like the different hormones that thread, th flood through our bodies and just that sense of relaxation that can come through, but also lubrication that can happen um, any kind of muscle tension that might build up in some areas could feel great and pleasurable or not so great. So we kind of, again, are learning through everything that we do, whether or not some things are working for us or not, and whether or not we want to do them again, but using 
things like lube are, is super duper important. In my practice, I'm often recommending Uber Lube. Good Clean Love has some great lube. There are also the ability to have lubes that um, have different ingredients in them because that can be really supportive. So some people like lubes that feel warming or that are tingling and cool. So those can all be things that are helpful if they help you. So responsive desire is a thing. We know that we're not always just aroused off the bat out of nowhere. Some people absolutely are, but not everybody is. Sometimes we kind of need some activity to start going and that create that means even more of a need for this creation of an erotic environment, whether with yourself or with a partner that you're thinking about all the different sensations in a space, what smells, sounds, tastes, what type of fabric is around you, what you know, sensations of any uh, lotions or um, any other kind of tactile, playful things. Like we think of feathers or we can think of, at my practice I have these little sensory gloves that I'll give out to people that have all these different sensations on them to play with but really just thinking creatively, playfully, how do I engage the senses of my body in a way that feels safe and arousing, or at least curious with myself? Those are things to really start to explore. And I do believe in exploring yourself before saying, hey, cool, here I am with a partner. And you know, if you don't know what to share with a partner, it can be difficult to have that communication with them of, oh, I like this, then I don't like that. But plenty of people really don't have a sense of their sexuality on their own and find that with another person there with them. And as long as there's open communication about what feels good, when things kind of feel neutral, I'm like, yeah, sure, you can keep going, I don't really feel much, or uh, nope, that's really gotta stop. If there's language for that, then, exploring with a partner before exploring with yourself can be just as fine as after exploring with yourself. Um, or if you never explore solo, that's okay too. But again, I'm a believer in solo exploration first and then sharing that with a partner. So that's kind of how I'll talk about this a little bit. In overall, we really need to kind of break down what sex means. For so many people, they're caught up in this idea that sex means penetration, it means penis and vagina. And that really is a small part of what sex can really be. Sex doesn't have to be penetrative, it doesn't have to be orgasmic. The umbrella of sex is so wide. And it's so much more than a vagina or a clitoris or a penis and testicles. There's so much that's involved in our sexual beings. You know, like if you think about your body and you know, kind of no matter who you are, what type of body you have, your penis, your clitoris, your vulva, your testicles are actually a small part of you as much as they might be a really important part of you. There's still the whole rest of your body to explore and enjoy. This is important for people who experience pelvic pain, but it's also important for everybody that I ever talk to. But it, it's just important to kind of break it down and realize there's this whole beautiful rainbow umbrella of what can be involved in sex. And exploring that doesn't have to be in like second fiddle to kind of big ass sex of penetrative sex. Um, or orgasmic sex, and it, the idea of a goal of orgasm in and of itself can make sex less enjoyable. So having just this open playground of sex that doesn't have a very specific goal or a specific route to get there is the fun and the journey versus the destination. And that's an, a really critical part of feeling at one with yourself and able to share a sexual experience with a partner or even able sometimes to do this thing of like kind of letting go into an experience whether it's on your own or with a partner so in terms of understanding your own body first and kind of sharing that later with another person think about our body parts and what's going on there right so the most people the majority of people with clitorises and vaginas need direct clitoral stimulation for optimal pleasure the majority of people with penises need direct penis stimulation for optimal pleasure. How to do this? So 
people with penises have external genitalia that are a bit more apparent to them. It's generally easier to see than a clitoris might be or a vagina might be. The majority of people with clitorises can't necessarily easily see their clitorises. And so looking in a mirror is great. Knowing what's there, seeing kind of where folds are, where hair is, where the texture of skin changes. That's all so important to knowing your own body. Many people encounter medical providers over and over and over and over. And those are the people who know their body sometimes better than they do. And then when you're thinking about how to enjoy your body sexually, and we have this disconnect of like, well, I don't know my body. How do I know how to share it? So kind of reclaiming some of that, that also helps with some of the trauma that happens with engaging with medical professionals over and over and being disconnected from your body can be really traumatizing. So kind of recapturing that for yourself and doing that in a way that says, I know my body, I know what it looks like, I know what it feels like, I know what seems to be my normal, where things are, what causes me pleasure, what causes me pain. That's really important um, and very empowering. So whether you have penis, vulva, and uh, clitorises, whatever is going on for your body, taking the time to explore your body without the objective of, oh, I'm just going to masturbate or have some like solo sex time and orgasm and be done with it, right? But take the time to look at your genitals, know what they're like, know where folds are, know where hair is, know where it's changes in texture of skin, where lubrication happens, where different sensations feel really loud and powerful or where they're kind of like dull and feel like nothing. Knowing that about your body is, is so, so important when we're thinking about sexual pleasure. For people with clitorises, there's a really, and vulvas, there's a really cool resource called omgyes.com where you can get there's really wonderful videos of people explaining what they do for their bodies, what feels good for them, and then videos that show you what they're doing. And then these really cool interactive videos that if you use your phone or a tablet, or if you have a computer with a touch screen, you can actually engage with the vulvas on the screen to get an idea of what works, what doesn't. And there's a really nice feedback system that's programmed in where the, the recording will let you know if you're doing that specific technique correctly. So, you know, moving faster, moving closer to the clitoris, further away from the clitoris, faster stimulation, um, longer strokes, it'll let you know what you're doing in real time. So later you can take that back to yourself and your own body or a partner's body and try different things. In general, I don't know of any resource like this that exists for people with penises. But in general, we can kind of take some of the information of direct, indirect, different motions and directions and lengths of strokes and things like that and take some of that information for playing with penises as well. So that's a resource for exploring. The other ideas there that are super helpful are using toys. Use toys, use aids as much as you would like, but maybe even a little more than you might already be comfortable with because they can open up a whole world of pleasure and comfort. And in terms of comfort, we can think of things like wedges, slings. If we're worried about fluids, there are special sheets that have like a more plasticky underside so that it kind of captures whatever fluids and then like you put it in the washing machine over easy. Different toys that have different accessibility functions. I talk a lot about that, whether it's in my practice on Instagram or at that drawer about how things can be held in hands or placed in different positions on other people's bodies, on pillows or other things around us so that we can play with them in ways that aren't as cumbersome and more playful and enjoyable. Some toys are more open for those things, for that kind of movement, and that other things are developed specifically for certain issues. Others are just kind of 
hard to use if you can't use them typically. But I can definitely see that the toy industry is moving to be more accessible for more people or specifically accessible for certain types of issues, which is really wonderful to see. So things like the O-Nut. So if you haven't looked, if you haven't heard about the O-Nut, take a minute, go Google it. Uh, I think it's O-H and then capital N-U-T. But there are these little interlocking rings that you can make kind of as long or as short as you need them that cushion for pelvic pain with penetration. You can put the O-nuts together to cause what's going to be penetrated to be smaller, which helps because then the person, if it's their body that is penetrating another person's body, it gives them the same, not the same, but a similar feedback of pleasure, of stimulation throughout their body, but not into the other person's body. If it's on a strap-on, then it doesn't matter so much that it can provide the feedback to something like a penis because it's a strap-on, which doesn't necessarily have the same amount of feedback coming to the person. But either way, the depth penetration, the depth of penetration is reduced, which can be very helpful for people who have pain when it's when their bodies have a deeper penetration. So there's that safety again, right? Of like, okay, cool. I know that it's not going to get there. It's not going to get as deep as that place is that then causes pain and I don't want to do this. So if we know there's safety there, then we can be more comfortable and enjoy the experience. There are also penetrative toys that if you look up what, if you're using dilators, whether anal or vaginal dilators, and you can see what girth they are, what the dimensions are, the length, then you can start to say, okay, what toys match up to those dilators, right? So when we're thinking about the length of a toy, the girth of a toy, also thinking about like how smooth a toy might be, whether or not we want the toy to warm or be cold or be body temperature, it's all different things out there. So like I'm talking about this thinking I'm not even doing it justice because if basically if there's a desire for something, there is probably a toy for it. And if there isn't a toy for it, somebody has talked about a modification for a toy to make it fit that. A really great technique of figuring out, hey, is the toy going to be okay with the different pain uh, issues that I have? Being able to say, okay, this is a dilator that I use. This is long enough. This is, you know, short enough, or this has the appropriate circumference for me to handle and still have pleasure with. That's a really great shortcut for getting there and knowing what's like kind of cool for your body. When you're thinking about sex with a partner now, so these are some of the things in yourself, but you, again, any of that can apply for a partner because whatever works for you can then shift over to being useful for a partner. When we're talking about sex with a partner though, something very, very important is the idea of teamwork, that you're both in this together. This can be complicated, especially if you have a new partner. Um, if it's a long-standing partner that you have, you're more likely to be more comfortable expressing to them what your hard lines are, what you're into, what you don't want to do. You might already have a language with each other. If you don't, or things have changed, it's a really great opportunity for you to say, hey, things have really changed for my body. We're going to need to talk about things that work for me now. The things that were going for me then, this is not working for me. In fact, maybe they're painful now or neutral, and I'm, I want to explore what new things could, or different things could actually be pleasurable for both of us here. That's if you have a long-standing partner, it's a little bit easier to do that with. A newer partner, one of my kind of go-to pieces of recommendation for that is the moment you're thinking, hmm, I think I'd really like to have sex with this person. I think they want to have sex with me. To say a little bit about that and kind of saying, you know, we might move into a sexual place, we might not. If we do, some things you should know about me are. And then letting them know, you know, if you're having a flare up or if you have a chronic issue that's always present, what those things are, how to manage around them, or that you'll let them know as things get there. And just so there's kind of the initiation of that conversation before sex starts to happen. If there are any activities that are a no, like any positions or things that are a must, like contraceptives. Knowing 
what those things are for yourself and then practicing and then being able to communicate them with a partner. So I can't necessarily tell you any particular positions that are better for you. That's really specific. You can kind of know that for most people with pelvic pain that have vaginas, deep vaginal penetration is usually not their thing. It's not going to be what's great for other people. It is. If we're trying to avoid deep vaginal penetration, there's the O-nut. And there's also training from physicians that have penetration from behind because that can usually cause deeper penetration or penetration when you're facing each other. If a person's legs are up, if the person being penetrated, if their legs are up, then that often also causes deeper penetration. Similarly, with somebody with anal penetration, if deeper penetration hurts, using O-nuts can be great and playing with different angles. I often recommend that whoever it is that is experiencing pelvic pain be the one that's in charge of the depth, the speed, intensity, any of that that can kind of play into sexual fun, that they should be more in control of that, especially as people are learning, then reduce the chances of it being a negative sexual experience. Because part of that sexual response cycle is an evaluation moment where you say, hmm, would I want to do that again? And if we're thinking about being more sexual beings, then we want to have more sexual experiences that are pleasurable. Again, that doesn't mean orgasmic and it doesn't mean penetrative, it's pleasurable. So you want to kind of stack the decks in your favor and set a situation for yourself that's likely to be more pleasurable. So you might want to do it again. I guess at the end of it all, really the thing to remember from anything that I've said today is that sex is like a playground and whether you're with yourself or you're with a partner, the idea is to enjoy sexuality, enjoy the umbrella of the experience of what can be involved in sexuality and to communicate about that with each other so that if you have, if you're communicating with another partner so that you can really move forward and enjoy more of your sexual experiences together. Thank you for listening to all of this today. I hope it helps.